Good morning. I'm David Zhu, Governor of the Auckland Grammar School Reserve Bank, and these are my teammates. Our decision is to hold the OCR at its current rate of 1.75%. The most recent figures of 0.5% quarterly change and 1.1% from March 2017 to March 2018 place the inflation rate on the lower end of the target band of 1-3% to CPI inflation and we believe that there is little possibility of a significant change despite there being some inflationary pressure. We feel that the inflation rate will remain well within the target band over the medium term. We also uh, considered the newly introduced stipulations on employment contained within the most recent policy targets agreement, which also helped us to include that there was no reason to change the rate. We considered the following aspects of the economy in coming to our conclusion. So, firstly, consumption, investment and government spending. These three are the primary components of aggregate demand. High spending and investment indicates an increase in aggregate demand and therefore possibility for demand pull uh, inflationary pressure. As you can see, consumer spending reached an all-time high in the fourth quarter of 2017 and moreover, the Westpac McDermott Miller Consumer Confidence Index in New Zealand increased in the first quarter of 2018 from the previous period. Higher consumer confidence results in people being willing to spend more because they have greater confidence in their continued income. Finally, the trend of increasing employment and decreasing unemployment suggests that consumers will have more disposable income, meaning that spending should increase. <coughs> As consumer spending grows, aggregate demand is increased and as a result, we feel there is possibility for some demand pull inflationary pressure. We also note the multiplier effect here. Spending creates income, which in turn creates even more spending. Furthermore, government spending is set to increase from 2018 with free first year university coming into effect, as well as a $32.5 billion total to be spent on infrastructure over four years. We feel that this increased government spending should boost inflation in the short term, noting, however, that infrastructural investment is likely to reduce uh, cost push inflation pressure in the long term by raising long-run aggregate supply. Thus, though broadly we see investment and spending as on the rise, we do acknowledge there are counteracting factors. Activity levels, though increasing, are still below the level six months ago. For instance, a net 28% of businesses still expect it to be tougher to obtain credit. The conclusion that we come to is that though spending and investment are evidently on the rise and are inflationary pressures, we feel as though they are not significant enough to warrant a change in the OCR. Currency and trade. Current global prospects suggest the need to lower the OCR. However, the level of instability suggests that holding the rate is the best option. New Zealand's exchange rates registered an appreciating trend in early 2018 before falling in April, as shown by the TWI, or the basket of different currencies weighted by their importance to trade to the New Zealand dollar. The, depreciation, the, dep the depreciation in April means a weak New Zealand dollar where our currency has lower purchasing power to purchase less imports, while stronger foreign currencies can purchase more of our exports. Thus, export prices will fall in foreign currency and import prices will rise in New Zealand dollars. In the long run, this tends to improve our trade deficit as foreign consumers buy more of our cheaper exports and domestic consumers buy less expensive imports. This is subject to the Marshall Learner condition that is to say, dependent on the relative price elasticities of demand of exports and imports. A lower deficit shifts aggregate demand to the right and inflationary pressure. The WTI price index of crude oil rose to almost 70 US dollars per barrel in April. Increasing world commodity prices may increase imported inflation. Because oil is a frequently used raw material in domestic industries, increasing oil prices will increase the cost of production. 
This causes aggregate supply to decrease, which is inflationary. Conversely, however, there are deflationary factors. Both the annual current account deficit and the deficit to GDP ratio rose from 2016 to 2017. If the deficit continues to worsen, it will pose a deflationary pressure as falling net exports decrease aggregate demand. We do note here that the balance of trade is only one component of the current account. The Australian economy is relatively less strong. Moreover, US-China trade tensions may reduce China's GDP growth rate, as well as consumer confidence. The same harms broadly apply to the United States. The weak economic outlook of our biggest trading partners is recessionary and may be a deflationary pressure. It suggests a need to lower the OCR. However, in spite of the bearish global outlook, there is a degree of large uncertainty which demands more prudence and a need to observe. We feel that this suggests that the OCR should be held. Employment and economic capacity. The new policy targets agreement taking effect from the 27th of March also requires, quote, monetary policy to be conducted so that it contributes to supporting maximum levels of sustainable employment within the economy, end quote. We see that if the employment rate is at an unsatisfactory level, the OCR could be lowered in order to stimulate greater consumer demand and therefore need for labour. However, employment in New Zealand is at a relatively high level. The employment rate remains constant, while the unemployment rate has fallen to its lowest level since December 2008. The labour force participation rate stands at only slightly below its all-time high. Some forecasts suggest that this high rate of participation is likely to continue in the future. This could be seen as an inflationary pressure. As the supply for labour decreases, higher wages will be demanded, which results in wage push inflation as firms must raise the prices of their goods to compensate. Concerns around recent tightening up of immigration policy also contribute to this, as a decrease in immigration could mean a further decrease in the supply of skilled labour. We also note here that New Zealand's productivity remains relatively high at its current rate and is projected by commentators to remain so. Hence, this, uh, this suggests to us that aggregate supply is unlikely to be influenced by productivity. Capacity utilisation has returned to 93.5% after declining. It appears to be a trend that the economy reaches peak capacity utilisation during the March quarter and then falls and then rises again. This suggests that the economy could gain some spare capacity in the short term. However, overall, the employment and economic and capacity utilisation uh, the employment and capacity utilisation indicators combined suggest that the New Zealand economy's output gap, which measures the difference between actual output and potential output, is small. This is concerning in that it means aggregate supply will not have much room to grow, which is an inflationary pressure, cost push inflationary pressure. However, this pressure is mild and, combined with the need for accommodative monetary policy uh, to maintain high levels of employment, holding rather than raising the OCR seems the more prudent option. GDP. For a predictor of future GDP growth, we look to ANZ's Truckometer Light Traffic Index, which gives a six-month lead on GDP and is a useful as a measure of economic momentum. The index suggests a slower period of growth mid-2018. Although GDP increased on quarter and year-on-year -year in the fourth quarter of 2017, both rates were below their respective market growth expectations. The year-on-year -year growth rate was also the slowest since September 2014. We see this as an indication that the economy is growing at a satisfactory but slow pace. This outlook of slowing economic growth is tempered by other forecasts that should suggest GDP is likely to maintain its current rate of growth rather than any significant decline. Thus, while we do see a deflationary pressure in decelerating GDP growth, we also note that this is not likely to be significant, which is suggested in us holding the OCR. Housing. House price inflation continues to slow down. Moreover, new regulations and measures have been put into place by the government, including, amongst others, banning of foreign speculators from buying existing homes. All these measures both reduce demand from buyers and increase the supply of houses. Moreover, this helps to lower inflation expectations, which in turn reduces inflationary pressure. In fact, 
This could even act as a deflationary pressure. Thus, house price inflation is not a major concern currently. In conclusion, for most aspects of the economy, deflationary pressures do not significantly outweigh inflationary pressures, and the same applies vice versa. We also note the high levels of employment which we would like to preserve via holding the rate. Thus, we believe that, that there will be price stability over the medium term, and therefore see no reason to change the rate. So for the first question, what things would you be looking for over the next 12 months that would make you cut the OCR? Um, if you want to cut so I think we've got to consider like some current events. So um, when the deflationary repressions outweigh the inflationary yep. repressions. So, well, the US-China tension, so that's yep. a big... I think what I talked about the global trade outlook. Yeah, how might yeah. that reduce the, um, how might that be a deflationary impression? Well, they reduce the domestic GDP over in China and USA if it escalates. So, yeah, therefore, especially. that means foreign consumers over there will demand less of our exports. Yep. Yeah. As, as I said, weak yeah. economic growth and our biggest trading partners could be recessionary. Yep. Um, could say infrastructure uh, projects closer to home, which yeah. increase longer in aggregate supply. Is over the next 12 months, though. We got to yeah, 12 over months. 12 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about, can we say, look at if our GDP continues, not not sluggish, but, but continues at its continues slow to pace? Slow down, yeah. 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 I mean, it's an all right, right right now, but if it continues slow, maybe yeah. there's some yeah. stimulus. Uh, nothing for employment. Employment's looking good in terms of... Yeah, I think employment's looking good. Employment's looking good. Um, okay. Could there be any sudden shocks there? But... Those are mainly, mainly inflationary, though. Yeah. We do have to consider, because like this OCR cut will take place 18 to 24 months in the future. Yeah, the MPTM. What, yeah, MPTM. Yeah. What, what might, say, happen in the next 12 months that gives an indicator of, say, two or even three years in the future for us to consider. Should we also look at the interest rates of other central banks? Yeah. Business confidence as well? That's yeah. been dropping Business a little confidence. bit. Okay. Yeah. Decreases yeah, investment. Yeah. yeah, and you touched on it, but... Uh, Federal... But Federal Reserve rate a little yeah, bit as well. Okay. Yeah, and you touched on that, but if, if the GDP growth rate of New Zealand continues, if it doesn't seem to, yeah, if it's okay. worryingly. Yeah, for the, for the interest rate, I wanted to say we want to maintain a small interest differential with the other banks. And because maybe. currently we have a, uh, a quite an outflow in the primary income. So. Yeah. Um, and maybe you want to consider those like trade agreements, how they're going to pan out. If they don't pan out too well, that yeah. might be. Yeah, lower the new confidence the new CP, 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 TPP. Yeah, yeah TPP. Yeah. Okay. All right. So essentially, what we think here is that what would have to happen over the next 12 months for the Reserve Bank to consider cutting the OCR would be if we see indicators that deflationary pressures were uh, at a significant level, substantial level, outweighing inflationary pressures. So what are the, some, some of the indicators that could suggest to us deflationary pressures outweighing inflationary pressures? Firstly, we see that if the trade tensions between US and China uh, grow worse, that's going to be recessionary and have a deflationary effect. The reason for that is that when you have these trade tensions between two of our tra biggest trading partners, that's going to be reducing the domestic GDP of these countries. And that's going to mean essentially that foreign countries uh, and consumers in these foreign countries are going to be demanding our exports less. They're going to be spending less on our exports. We receive less export receipts. And because we see that exports, or rather net exports, is a very crucial component of aggregate demand, having less net exports is going to bring our aggregate demand down and the effect of that essentially that's going to be deflationary because we see aggregate demand is going down. But we also see other factors that might point towards there being deflationary pressures. Two of the biggest factors are one, if the current rate of GDP growth uh, is continues to slow down, if it, the economy economic growth uh, continues its slow pace place into next year, uh, we see that as a recessionary deflationary factor and we might consider an OCR cut because of that. But we also see that business confidence in recent months haven't been the best. So if we see that business confidence 
is dropping in these uh, next 12 months, that indicates to us that businesses are less likely to invest and less investment, which is also a component of aggregate demand, means that we see aggregate demand dropping, means that we see deflationary pressures. The final factor to note here is the interest rates and trade outlooks of other countries. Essentially, we think it's important to keep in uh, mind what other reserve central banks of other countries are doing. For instance, the Federal Reserve's central official cash rate, what they're doing over there, that's going to have an impact in terms of like if they, if they are lowering it, whether or not we choose to lower it. But finally to say, uh, in terms of some of the trade agreements we've got, if that turns out to have a deflationary pressure, we would also consider cutting the OCR. Fantastic. Very well done. Next question. Why is it important for the bank to consider a wide range of measures of inflation, such as tradables inflation, non-tradables inflation, and core inflation? Well, okay, well, well, what I see here is presumably tradables and non-tradables inflation, they will have different causes, right? And some of them might be more temporal than others. So for instance, um, for instance, something like non-tradables inflation, right? um, I don't know, if it's a domestic produced product, that's probably going to mean if there are adverse weather patterns, for instance, happening, that's going to be like a short-term temporal impact. If the cause of inflation is like massively due to that, or for instance, if the government has a one-off uh, cigarette alcohol tax and that boosts the price of those products up, that's probably less alarming than, say, if we got tradables inflation, if oil prices are going up, right? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think you can make an overall summary that we have to take like a macroscopic overall outlook of the economy yep. so that we yep. make the most informed judgments and decisions. So to you know, meet most of the needs of the majority population or something along those lines. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, I guess like OCR is like one rate as well. So whatever you've said it at, it's going to have like similar effects to like mm -hmm. trade yeah. like domestic. Um, and maybe in terms of like unintended consequences on the exchange rate in terms yeah. of how that's going to yeah. impact tradables um, inflation. Yeah. yeah definitely. Okay. So just be more factors to consider when you're trying to set the OCR. Yep. You definitely have to consider um, the exchange rate and how, like, when you change the OCR, you expect a change in the exchange rate to follow. Yep. Positive yeah. relationship. And you should also say that uh, changes in the OCR will effectively <coughs> affect all the interest rate, the commercial interest mm. rates in the market. So yeah. they will have a very wide-ranging effect. So we have to. Therefore, we have to take a wide-ranging uh, look of the entire economy. And yeah. 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 Right. So what we think is that the reason for why you would need to be considering separate categories of inflation and tradables and non-tradables is because when we're considering whether or not there is a sufficient amount of, for instance, inflationary pressure in the economy for us to be raising the OCR, inflation comes from different causes. So in terms of like non-tradable inflation, so more domestic causes, we see that could have causes, uh, say for instance, if you got a one-off abnormal adverse weather, that's going to have an impact on the domestic amount of our agricultural products uh, produced. But that's a, that's a temporary effect, that's not something that's a long-term trend. Also, we see, for instance, if the government imposes a one-off excise uh, tax on cigarettes or alcohol at the start of the year, that's not an indicator of long-term trends of where the prices of these products are going. That's a one-off tax. That's a temporal. That's a temporary effect. That's. Uh, boosted up the prices of these things and therefore boosted up inflationary pressure in the economy as a whole, but that's not necessarily an indicator of what the long-term trends in inflation are. But conversely, we see that when you do consider, for instance, non-tradables inflation, these might give off more alarming warning signs. So if we see that in terms of exports and imports, oil prices being imported from overseas are rising, that might be something to consider as a huge inflationary pressure because that's a trend and because we see that we use a lot of oil in terms of uh, as part of our costs production. So we say that 
In terms of considering inflation as a whole, when we break it down to non-tradables inflation and tradables inflation, we have to consider where in the economy is that inflation come is that inflation coming from, and whether or not that's coming from a source that is uh, likely to be temporal, one-off, or short-term, or whether or not some it's coming from something that is suggesting a longer trend, so that we might consider, uh, for instance, raising the OCR. Okay, can I have a follow-up question? Yeah. yeah. So, which measure of inflation do we actually target? Measure of inflation. Yeah, oh, CPI. Target, right? yeah. Which measure of inflation do we target? Oh, Sorry, CPI. CPI. Yeah, CPI. Yeah. CPI. Wait, then they use the then they use the different indicator for deflating the GDP. Yeah. So, um, so what is that? Implicit GDP deflation. I'm not sure about yeah. the components they include. Are the prices facing producers? So, like the. Right, they prices. include the import prices, the <coughs> goods and services prices. Uh, if I can interrupt, it's a really simple question. Yeah, oh, just oh. Just okay. Um, right, so we primarily use the uh, CPI, the Consumer Price Index, to look at whether or not there's a raise in price, but we also say the Reserve Bank probably looks at more advanced indicators like the implicit GDP to flow. So okay, the, the, the actual target by, by the, with the policy targets agreement is the Consumer Price Index, right? right. So the real question, sorry, the real question is, is that a good idea? CPI. Right, yeah, so, so is that a comprehensive yeah, indicator? Well, well, CPI mm. is, is good for inflation for consumers, but for is, that, is that overall kind of indicator for the entire economy? It, it, there's a lot of aspects that it doesn't yeah. take into account, yeah. which is why we have all those all other kind of measures like, like the implicit price yeah. investment yeah. spending yeah. from yeah. the CPI. Yeah, and it's probably, it's probably spending the best, best yeah, indicator it's we best have. for the but purpose, otherwise but we wouldn't still, be using it right yeah. now. Yeah, but it's, it's still like inaccurate, so we've got a so common sure. of so it. component of AD. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't include house prices, I think. Yeah. Right. Well, since, since, the, since the information... Does it doesn't include mortgage for payment? I don't think so. No, don't since the so. statistics for the CPI come from the household economic oh, survey, it just takes into years. account um, oh, yeah, yeah. inflation for kind of uh, uh, goods and services that affect households, but yeah. not necessarily the wider economy. So I think for it targeting inflation, yeah. you know, it, uh, the question is: is it the best? Me is it a good idea to use that? Yeah. Could we also yeah, say yes. like? Well, A, that basket of goods probably isn't comprehensive enough yeah. because it's being updated, yeah. you know, once every three years. It's, yeah. it, it lags behind the actual changes in the economy, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but um, it's still definitely, like, a good idea because yeah. it's yeah. one of the best indicators that we have, I think. Yeah, there's it's a reason that we got to look at other factors and, like, temper it as well. Um, like what you were talking about, those other indicators. Yeah, so as long as it's because a lot of review the basket yeah. a lot of wider regions. indicators have a lot of things that are kind of not as relevant for example like yeah. heavy mach like i don't know like stuff that firms heavy yeah. machinery that doesn't really affect inflation for the majority of new Zealanders. Yeah. yeah well we can probably say like if we're looking at who inflationary pressures affects are actually affecting a lot of it yeah. it's going to be therefore cpi is a good thing mm -hmm. yeah okay so we think that using the cpi as the primary measure to uh, measure inflationary uh, it is in some parts flawed, but overall it is the best measure we have and it is probably uh, what we can get. We think it is the best measure so far. So looking at why we think uh, the CPI is in some ways flawed, we say that for a few reasons. Firstly, we say that the CPI only primarily uh, measures consumption to a comprehensive extent. That means that you are unlikely to see a lot of the effects of uh, government uh, spending, business investment, also, for instance, mortgage repayments and house prices appear in the CPI. Now, these things are pretty big components of aggregate demand in our economy, but they aren't comprehensively measured by the CPI. We also say the method by which the CPI is compiled and all the statistics appear is in some respects flawed. Uh, why do we say this? We say this because, one, it's a basket of goods that have been picked out in the economy, and while that is a lot of goods, we don't think that's necessarily always going to be comprehensive. But also, furthermore, the Households Economic Survey, which takes place every three years, that, that measures these the prices of these goods and determines what goes into these baskets only takes place three years. So there is likely to be a degree of lag of the CPI in terms of the accuracy of the goods that are used as a barometer for the economy, there might be some lag behind what actually is going on in the economy. Uh, but 
Considering these flaws, we say that broadly the CPI is probably still the best indicator we have and is probably still in response, direct response to the question, the, the best idea, the, the, a good idea to use it as a measure of inflation. And the reason for that is that, one, we think a lot of the inflationary pressures and effects, the vast majority of those are going to be taking place for the average consumer, for the New Zealand consumer. So it's probably a good idea to be looking at a measure that primarily considers them. But also, we say when the CPI is used in conjunction with other indicators, it probably uh, does paint a quite a comprehensive picture of what inflationary inflation is looking like in the New Zealand economy. We've probably got time for one more question. Uh, can you tell me uh, how monetary policy can or cannot, cannot affect employment? How can it not affect employment? Can or cannot. Okay. So, oh, there's a lot of stuff to consider, isn't there? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, firstly, so, so, like most basic, it's probably. Uh, raising monetary policy is going to have a direct impact on consumption so people's demand that feeds into businesses but um you guys talk about investment yes, and government spending, yeah, yeah. Um, wait so monetary policies are effectively demand side policy so they are unlikely to have any effect on supply side factors yep. so like structural un unemployment for example oh is this how it's not gonna affect? yeah how okay. it's yeah, not okay. gonna affect yep and Wait, so structural so and structural, so yeah, structural yeah. you can mention, mention technological, yeah, technological unemployment. Yep, that's true, that's true. Yeah, so if you got and like friction, an industry... Frictional. Frictional, yeah. yeah. So if you got like an industry that's like not doing so well, demand side, it's difficult to like, you know, boost that because yeah, yeah, they don't have investment <laughs> in these industries, okay. Um, what about can though, so... Maybe talk effects. about like incentives, how, mm -hmm. it, how it lowers... Yeah, okay. If you raise, it lowers incentives yeah. to work. You, you can reduce cyclical unemployment, yeah, so it's cyclical, a demand yeah. efficient unemployment. Yep. Cyclical, uh, uh, raise the interest rate. Wait, you're, you're decreasing the interest rate if you want to promote employment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're decreasing the interest rate. So <coughs> it's, so you will increase investment spending, you investment will spending. also increase consumption spending. Yeah. Yep. So these will all indirectly promote employment. Yep. Yep. So okay. Yeah. Right. So we think in terms of using monetary policy to address unemployment, because monetary policy is a demand side policy, it's unlikely to have a lot of uh, big impacts on aggregate supply and therefore the mechanism by which it has a direct impact on reducing unemployment, <coughs> so lowering the OCR to stimulate employment, is primarily demand side. We'll go through the components one by one. So the first big impact is that we see that monetary policy can have a big impact on consumption. If you lower the interest rate, it's going to mean people have a greater propensity to consume, people have more spending, more disposable income, and when people spend more, it means that the demand for goods and services goes up, right? So when demand for goods and services goes up, firms naturally are going to need more uh, labor to produce these goods and services which people demand, which is going to directly result in more employment because firms seek to employ more workers. The next impact it's going to have is on investment, uh, in terms of not only overseas investment, but business investment uh, in, in projects, business investment in other companies, and that's going to create more employment as well. And we also see well, uh, government spending, that's an impact. But also, furthermore, uh, we see in our exports and imports, when our export industries have the interest rates lowered, uh, it's easier for them to be producing and selling exports overseas, and that's going to increase employment. So we say that's the demand side, how, uh, it, how employment can be targeted, unemployment can be reduced via the monetary policy. But we also see some areas where there is a blind spot for demand side monetary policy that it cannot effectively <coughs> reach. And the reason for that is because we don't because we don't see monetary policy as effectively targeting aggregate supply, that's not going to address some of the issues in unemployment that's 
infrastructural, that's structural unemployment, that's frictional unemployment. What we mean by this is that if we have certain industries that are um, mass unemploying workers that are laying off workers that don't have as much employment because of the structural issues, uh, because uh, technological issues, because the costs of production are far too high, monetary policy does not target that. Monetary policy does not increase the accurate supply, monetary policy does not effectively reduce uh, their cost of production, and th so therefore we can't reach unemployment through that. But we do say overall monetary policy can target unemployment through the demand side. Thank you. Um, you can now relax. <laughs> so we're finished.